Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to introduce the fourth uh, session of talks. Uh, my name is Anna Montagnini. I'm a researcher at the Institut de Neurosciences de la Timon. And the fourth session focuses on uh, sensory integration. In particular, it's about vision, uh, visual integration and visual motor behavior. First speaker is uh, Dr. Guillaume Masson, uh, who's a researcher and the director of the Institut de Neurosciences de la Timon. He's an expert on uh, visual processing of motion and on oculomotor control. And he will uh, tell us uh, about dynamics of visual uh, motor integration in human and non-human primates. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, and then it works uh, when I move it. Okay, thanks for the, uh, the introduction and the, the opportunity to uh, talk about what we're doing here. Um, what I would like to talk today is um, the, how the brain control uh, eye movements, but from a sensory perspective, that is, what is the visual information processing that is needed in order to control eye movements, and particular tracking eye movements. And the first thing I'd like to do is to try to reconcile uh, two sides of the world is that in eye movement, people usually they look at global image motion, which is supposed to drive reflexive tracking like the optokinetic nystagmus. And this is driven by just low level uh, motion processing. And then from those responses, you can eventually uh, try to understand whether the very low level processing probably in the retina or in the visual cortex or in the subcortical nuclei. On the other extreme, there is this uh, complex image uh, motion when you try to single out a single object here a leaf and eventually you drive voluntary smooth pursuit that is you actively track the target my my point is that in fact this is there is a just a single visual motion computation that unfolds over space and time that is as the time goes on you have more and more complex uh, visual processing of the inputs that allows you to Refix, reflexively uh, start the tracking, but also at some point to allow the attention and decision making and all this higher cognitive stage coming in and so that you track the motion of that leaf and not the others. The counterpart is that there is uh, not two different systems, but uh, there is a single ocular tracking behavior and you can track this sensory to motor transformation over time. So it means that the question we are interested in is, is what is the complex front end processing that you need in order for the brain to, to compute object motion, that is to segment it and then integrate the local motion. Um, what is the dynamics of this processing and how it impacts the dynamics of tracking our movement? And to, to do that, we proposed a couple of years ago, a theoretical framework which is what we call the behavioral receptive field. So what is a behavioral receptive field? What we do in a lab is that basically we, we in either monkeys or humans, we present stimuli and then we record eye movement responses. The question is that what is the black box? And in a black box, you can have two approaches. One is uh, what is the series of uh, computational steps that needs to be done in order to transform this input to this output? And can you relate each step to a particular cortical step for instance, uh, in driving the eye movement. And, and so it's behavioral because it's defined at behavior level. Uh, but I'd like to stress or remind people that in fact, the original definition of a receptive field was put forward by uh, Sir Sherrington a uh, very long time ago, early 20th, 20th century. And they define it as a whole collection of point of skin surface that from which the scratch reflex can be elicited in dogs. So it was originally, before it becomes operational at neuronal level, it was originally a definition that was set at behavioral level. That is the, the sensory input and the, the spatial temporal structure of the sensory input that drives a behavioral response. What is usually within a receptive field? Well, you have a series of processing steps. One is uh, the um, a bunch of filters that eventually sample the image and extract the local motion. You have uh, some nonlinear gain control that is in order to control the sensitivity of the image depending on the structure of the luminance distribution. You have some dynamical contextual modulation that is the way you process information in one particular point of the image would depend on the other statistics in the other parts of the image. 
and eventually you extract uh, features like direction of speed. This is really what you need if you want to control your eyes. And that implies an um, extension on inhibition interactions, not in space, but in higher level feature representation space, like the, uh, the spatial temporal and uh, frequency space. So I would like just to, today to take a few examples of what we can do and what is the, uh, the logic behind it and how you can, you can probe those different steps using a simple, from simple to naturalistic stimuli. So first we need a behavioral probe and the behavioral probe is something which is called ocular following. The, all the experiments are usually very simple. You have to subject or the monkey to fixate. There is a gap stimulus and then you present the stimuli and all the conditions are interleaved and you don't ask anything to the human volunteers or to the monkey. You don't reward the monkey for the tracking he would do to the, to the, to the visual stimulus but you would reward the monkey only if he has been fixating correctly before the stimulus onset. And since everything is unexpected because it's all um, interleaved, there's no cognitive biases, there's no prediction. And what you have is a bunch of, this is from monkey, this is a very old stuff from the fried mice back in the eighties, where you have, uh, this is high velocity profiles and here you have something like 200 trials for a single condition. And you can see that uh, this is uh, the eye movement onset the latency is very, very short. In monkeys, it's uh, 55 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds. And in humans, it's uh, 85, 90 milliseconds. And it's automatic. So it's always there. So you have your behavioral probe. And this is the, the beautiful work done by uh, Kenji Kawano back in the 90s. It, it took him maybe 15 years to do that. So the, he was recording the eye movements to a single stimulus. And at the same time, we were sticking an electrode in the cortical parietal cortex, like for instance, the area MT, and he was recording the discharge of neurons. And what he found is that the neurons discharge most of them just discharge just a few milliseconds before the onset of eye movements. Like the latency in MT is 40 milliseconds. And as in monkeys, the latency of the eye movements is 55 milliseconds. And all the directions are represented. That Cortical uh, structure project downstream to a uh, brainstem area, downstream nuclei, in particular the dorsolateral pontine nucleus. And I will not go to the details, but, but just to mention that you can track the flow of information, the neural flow information, and track related in time with the eye movement. And again, here it's just a few milliseconds later, and all the directions are represented. And in uh, the uh, ventral parafoculus lobule, which is part of the cerebellum, which is just before the ocular motor, the motor uh, part of the tracking system. The, the onset of the neurons is the time lock with the onset of the response and only the uh, horizontal and vertical, that is motor coordinates are represented. So to make it short, you can track the uh, flow of information. So what about in terms of computational processing? Well, you can define the some properties uh, like the center surround properties, for instance, or the, how you extract the speed selectivity from the behavior and you have tuning functions. And the, the, the game, if I say so, is to reverse engineering this behavioral uh, observations and relate that to the properties of neuronal um, population uh, in the MST area, which is receiving information from the MT area, which is receiving information from the V1 area. So um, you can define a dynamical behavioral receptive field and the, the game is to relate that to the dynamical population receptive field that you can find in those different areas. And to do that, I will give you just two examples. You can look at the spatial temporal dynamics of contrast gain control and center cell interactions. And you can also look at the uh, temporal dynamics of uh, interactions between um, channels in order to compute speed. So what is key words are temporal dynamics. You understand that they give you a hint about what is driving what. Tuning, you should have the same tuning. And also the human and human, non-human comparison is very important because you can always uh, do the same thing together. So first example, let's say you present a single moving stimulus and then each trial has a different contrast. So it's a grating here moving leftward with different contrast. Here on the left side, you have the uh, mean high velocity of the responses for a monkey and here it's for a human. This is a very low contrast, so almost no response. And as you increase the contrast, the responses get shorter 
in terms of latency on larger in terms of amplitude. And it's the same behavior in, in both human, uh, humans and monkeys. Um, what is important is that, let's say you have these responses and then every 10 milliseconds, you measure the relationship between the output and the input. That is the creating contrast on the eye movement response. And those are the, what we call uh, the contrast response function. And you can see that as time goes on, it shifts to the left. So the sensitivity is higher and the slope is also uh, uh, sharper. And then you can compute uh, the contrast response function and extract parameters that shows that dynamics. So to take it is that the system becomes more and more sensitive. And that's really what gain control is about. A couple of years ago with, uh, with uh, Fred Chavan, uh, we did uh, the same experiment, but uh, he was recording from the uh, monkey visual cortex, primary visual cortex using uh, voltage sensitive dye imaging. And the monkeys were presented with uh, the same stimuli, increasing contrast. And they were recording the activity of the neuronal population uh, over a piece of the cortex using a fluorescent dye that was um, staining the cortex. And I, I will make it very, very short to, to just illustrate that. Um, this is the piece of cortex, and then we're going to record over the whole piece of cortex, and then we here we'll focus only on this part. And that's the um, uh, evoked population response uh, over the cortex for a high contrast stimulus. And then you can uh, sample it and uh, look at this time course. This is for uh, mid contrast. You see that the response is large, is smaller and goes uh, less far across the, the, the cortex. And this is for a very low contrast. And you can see that you have a very sparse response with almost no propagation along the cortex. What's, what's interesting is that then you have a, a times, you can take times beans uh, of the responses and you can do exactly what I've done previously for the uh, ocular following. That is you plot the amplitude of the response as a function of the contrast every 10 milliseconds, okay? And you fit a function and you extract a relevant parameter that gives you the sensitivity of the contrast response function. And you do that across the whole time bean and you see exactly what I've shown for the humans. That is the sensitivity, the contrast sensitivity decreases over time. And we, in the same monkey, we did uh, this, the, at the same time, the uh, voltage sensitive dye imaging on the ocular following experiment. And to make it short, you can see that you have exactly the same dynamics. That is the, as the time goes on, the contrast response function shift to the left, that is increased sensitivity and the slope also increases. And if you compare those parameters for um, the voltage sensitive dye in red and the ocular following in the orange, you see that the parameters have the same temporal dynamics. They don't have the same absolute value, which is makes sense, but they have the same temporal dynamics. And the latency is constant. That is the V1 response is always uh, 20 to 30 milliseconds before the uh, uh, ocular following response, but they change accordingly. So to summarize what we propose is that this contrast, what we call contrast gain control, that is how the system set its sensitivity is, uh, could be explained uh, by a local mechanism of our cortex that involves lateral interactions. That is how the signals from the periphery propagates toward the center in order to normalize the activity. It's pretty much what your, your iPhone or whatever camera is doing what is trying to control the sensitivity of its sensor depending on the brightness that you have in the surround. The thing is that the temporal dynamics is very similar in the primary visual cortex and in the ocular tracking response. So that is a hint that you can explain this first aspect of the behavior receptive field by this V1 population uh, activity. This is local. But what would going on at a more distant level? And then it, in sensory system, this is called center surround information. That is how the processing of the information at some point of the image is modulated in a context dependent fashion by the surround. And depending on the properties of the surround, its trends, but also its, its uh, feature selectivity and so on. Um, a first classical signature that is found in neuronal level is also found at population le at behavioral level. It is if you present stimuli of increasing sizes, and this is the responses in the monkey, 
you have high velocity as a function of time. Um, this, as you increase the size of the stimulus, you increase the response up to an optimal. And then as you keep increasing the size of the stimulus, the response decreases. And this is what you can show you see here, which is just an, a quantitative estimate of the response amplitude as a function of the grating or the stimulus diameter. You first have an increase, which is what people call the spatial summation area, and then you have a decrease. And that decrease is a signature of an inhibitory surround mechanism. And over time, this is early in the response and this is late in the response. And you can see that this inhibition, the surround inhibition is getting larger and larger. How can you test that? When uh, you have a small problem relative to what people are doing in neurophysiology is that if you put something in the surround, it's going to drive a response. And eventually what you can see is, is a motor interaction or not a sensory interaction. So the trick that we use that we present a center, a moving stimulus in the, in the center, and we present a counterphase stimulus in the surround. So you have motion say upward and downward. So the net motion is zero. And if you present the, stim the surround stimulus only, you don't have any ocular motor response, okay? So you cancel the motor effect. That's an example in, in humans. Um, that's the contrast response function that I just showed when the stimulus is presented alone and when it's presented together with an antagonistic surround. And what you see that the responses are lower. What in, is interesting is that you compare those two time windows. The first one, you see that you don't have any difference be, on, between the two contrast response functions, that one that you have when there is no surround, the white dot, and then the one that you have with an iso-oriented surround. But if you, sorry, if you look just uh, 30 milliseconds later, you can see that then the two curves are separated. It means that when there is a surround, the contrast sensitivity of uh, the system is changing. And in fact, it's getting lower. That is the, the response is, is suppressed. We, we got exactly the same results in monkey. Uh, you can see this is the surround only, this is the, the sorry, the center only, and this is the surround uh, plus center. And you can see that the difference grows over time, indicating that this uh, context modulation increases over time. So again, you have a temporal dynamics. Again, we did the same experiment with uh, Alex Reynaud and Quentin Montardi, who were two PhD students of French Havan. And um, we wanted to look at not only what happened when you have this uh, proximal stimulus, but what also would happen if you have a more distant stimulus, okay? And how the information would travel from the periphery to the center to modulate the sensory processing in the center. So just to make it short, let's say you have the cortical population contrast response function over time, exactly what I showed before when the stimulus in the center is presented alone. And that's the ocular following in the same monkey when the stimulus is presented alone. So you can see that as time goes on, the contrast response function grows up and it becomes more and more sensitive. What about if you present a stimulus, a surround stimulus far in the periphery? Well, nothing. That is over the time window we look at, there is very weak effect. Notice that there is a much larger effect in ocular following. Well, maybe there is another stage where these very far uh, inputs can modulate the response, but this should not be done in the level of V1. Now, if you present something in a close vicinity of the center, then you have a very strong suppression, both for the cortical response and for the uh, ocular following response. So just to uh, summarize what I've just shown uh, up to now, is that um, first of all, um, ocular tracking, uh, reflexive ocular tracking is not driven by en masse motion of the retinal image. So let's just forget about this uh, uh, optokinetic response, which is just driven by when everything is moving en masse. To be driven, it needs a fast integration that is shaped both by linear and nonlinear mechanism. And from those, you can infer the spatiotemporal structure of the behavioral receptive field. That is, you can define what is the central bit, uh, the center of the behavioral receptive field. This is a zone of linear integration. There is a, a nonlinear contrast uh, gain control. This is the regulate the sensitivity. But you have also a surround of the behavioral receptive field, 
which is uh, around the uh, central integration zone. And it comes to modulate the contrast gain mechanism and it's delayed and it's slowly building up. That is the inhibition takes time. And it's something very, always very constant in sensory system. The feed forward things uh, is fast, but the surround inhibition or any inhibitory mechanism is slow. And I will give you uh, to uh, in the, the few minutes that I, 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 I am available with, I will just give you uh, an example. So just now look at another domain, which is feature selectivity. You need to pull information because you need to compute direction and speed. But if you track a car, it says, you can track the whole shape of the car. And you can also eventually track the uh, head of the driver. Uh, they have different sizes, so different spatial frequencies, but eventually, because they all move together, they have the same speed. So in, in visual uh, computation, what it means is that you have different, this visual scene can be uh, seen as different spatial frequencies, different temporal frequencies, and computing a speed is to have a mechanism that is aligned with this particular line in the log log space, okay? Something very fancy, but very simple. In fact, you have coarse, very coarse or very fine uh, inputs, but you need to put them together in order to compute that line. If you compute that line, what are the um, um, interaction mechanism? If you have those, each point is a special temporal frequency channel that would be a V1 neuron, but how do they interact? Do they positively interact along this line or negatively interact along the other lines? And what is the pattern of uh, excitation inhibition interaction? So, um, there's something we have been doing over the last uh, two or three years, and I just want to give you a, a short hint that we can do that by having different stimuli that just, you just distribute them, you build triplets, and you can align them along this line, or let's say along a vertical one. And what you can do is that you present, you compute the triplets, you have the stimulus, you have the response, and here, what you, this is the continuous line. And here, you can also do something very simple is that you compute the average of the response to each component presented independently. And that gives you the linear prediction. And you can see that here, the linear prediction on the, on the observed results are very similar, but in that conditions, they are very dissimilar. And that's something we use systematically to map these interactions. And uh, to make a long story uh, very short, if the inputs are aligned along the ISO velocity line, there is no uh, excitation, or for some participants, there is excitation. But if they are mapped cross oriented to this velocity line, there is a very strong inhibition as shown by this is the observed response, and this is the linear prediction. And you can do that for the whole space, and you can see that you have excitatory. Here, this is given by the, the, the quantitative measurements. So positive is excitation, negative is inhibition. So you have excitatory boost when you use stimuli along, uh, aligned along this line. And there is suppressions when they are uh, cross-oriented. And also the, the suppression is even larger if the stimuli are distant. And they are larger as the time goes on. Again, inhibition takes time. So, to conclude that what we have as a pattern of interactions, excitatory along this line, inhibitory anywhere else, and that would depend on the angle of the stimuli as well as the time. And we can, we propose to, with uh, Pascal Mamassian and students, uh, a new way of looking at that. I don't want to get into the details, but we should look at what's going on as a pattern of interactions like excitatory, excitation and inhibition in this, uh, speed, but also special temporal frequency space. So to conclude, um, I've summarized uh, many things that we've done, but I would like to just uh, emphasize that, okay, you have a bunch of processing that uh, can be linear, uh, linear integration mechanism. Uh, there are also nonlinear context dependent modulation that form the basis of the special temporal structure of the receptive field. You can't find um, um, neuron evidence for neuronal implementation at population level. That's very important population level because you don't want to relate the behavioral receptive field with the property of a single neuron. You want to relate that to the property of the population of neurons. 
But one uh, well, the key thing to relate that, as I showed, is the dynamics, the temporal dynamics. Look at how the processing varies over time, both at neuronal level and behavioral level. And it's the same thing for now what we're doing on the coding on speed. You need to look at the pattern of interactions, excitation and inhibition. That would depend on the spatial temporal structure, not in space, but in the higher representation space, like the spatial frequency, the temporal frequency, and the speed. I know we're doing exactly the same experiment in mammals and monkeys, together with Nick Prieber in, at the University of Austin, because we can then look at the interaction of the population in area MP using a two photon microscopy. And I just want to thank uh, people I've been working with over the years, and uh, Neopto team, and Invite team in Marseille, and the Vision team in Paris, uh, and uh, a little bit late, but I thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions either from the Q&A section or if you raise your hand, I will see it. Okay, so let me just try and understand how to... Oop. So, uh, sorry, I'm trying to give you permission to speak. <laughs> And uh, okay, here you are, Laurent Goffin. Laurent, can you can Not you speak here. out? Up. I think I, I asked him to unmute. Sorry. Otherwise, Laurent, can you write your question in the Q&A, please? Okay. Or, no, can you speak now? Uh, oui, vous m'entendez? Yes. OK. Yes. Uh, so thank you for, for this uh, interesting talk. I have a question uh, about the, the physiological plausibility of uh, this uh, model. Uh, how do you imagine that V1 activity reached the oculomotor system? I suppose, uh, considering the introduction of your talk, that it uh, reaches the oculomotor system through its through projections from V1 to MT and MST area. That's right. And uh, if it is so, then uh, I have difficulties to understand uh, how we can interpret uh, the, the fact that uh, Newsom, Wurz, and Komatsu in 1988 uh, reported that uh, MT 90. 92%, almost 100% of the neurons in MT, MST, start firing after the onset of the eye movement. The second uh, problem with this uh, idea that, uh, that MST and the M M MT area would uh, drive the onset of eye movements is the observation by um, uh, Vincent Ferreira, who showed that the firing rate of uh, MT neurons and MST neurons do not differ between the go and the no-go trials. In other words, the neurons discharge the same way whether the eye moves or not. In yeah. which case, in which case, it's just uh, the activity is mo mostly involved in processing uh, uh, visual input, but there is no evidence from my viewpoint that uh, these areas are involved in the generation of uh, pursuit time movements in the onset of pursuit time movements. No, there, there, are, there are two lines of evidence. First is the work done by uh, Kawano that if you, in monkey, if you, uh, the re exactly the result that I showed you, if you make a lesion of area MT on MST, the earliest part of the response is gone, disappear. Okay, so you need the integrity of MT on MST to have this uh, short latency ocular firing responses, first thing. Second thing is that if you look at the, the latency of the neuronal population in MT and MST, you do have a, a significant fraction of the neurons that fire five or 10 milliseconds before they respond to their, uh, the ocular tracking onset. There's just a, a fraction of those. You still have neurons that would respond after the onset. So that's because the work is not done and you have a series of eye acceleration and so the contribution of MT and MST is going to be building up over time. It is not just the uh, ocular track, they're just the first 10 milliseconds of initiation. So those two lines of evidence says that in monkeys, 
he has to go through empty anonymity. There was a second question by Professor Zhao Ping. I don't know. Uh, she lowered her hand, though. So, if there aren't any other questions, maybe we can move on to the next presentation and we would be in perfect time. <laughs> and you can always uh, keep writing uh, your questions on the Q&A section and we will ask all the speakers to answer, typing the answer. So the next speaker is Professor Fabrizio Dorique. Thank you for joining on, on the virtual stage. So he is a full professor at the psychology department of uh, Università La Sapienza in uh, Rome. Uh, his main interests are about uh, visual selective attention and uh, mathematical cognition um, in children. And today uh, he will present his work about space and number processing in the healthy and damaged human brain. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am, of course, very pleased to be here and discuss uh, the work we run in my lab and share it with uh, you all. Uh, my, my main interest in I've been in uh, uh, neuropsychology, clinical neuropsychology of uh, uh, attention, and generally speaking, in cognitive neuroscience of attention and uh, math cognition. Um, I divide, in order to give a flavor of what we do in our lab, I've divided the, my talk in two sections. And the, the talk is mainly focused in the study of patients with uh, neglect. Uh, to, to, to make a very uh, long story short, uh, um, uh, patients who, who suffer from right brain damage uh, very often lose the ability to represent or pay attention to the left side of space. Uh, this is a, a typical example of a, a task. It's called the line bisection task, where patients are asked to bisect the line. And as you can see, they move the line, the, the, the bisection mark toward the right. Here we have the uh, a nice drawing by Federico Fellini, who was uh, a very famous neglect patient, unfortunately, at the moment in his life. Um, uh, why neglect? Neglect, well, is, is relevant for two uh, reasons. First of all, there is a clinical reason. Patients with neglect have uh, a poor uh, outcome, so it is important to improve uh, uh, the, the, the functional and anatomical origin of neglect in order to improve the diagnosis and the rehabilitation of these patients. And on the other hand, they, uh, it's, it has been over the years really informative uh, for studying uh, the neural basis of uh, spatial cognition. So in the last year, there is a lot of evidence in the very studied field, but there is very, very few evidence concerning um, electrophysiological brain responses. And we were cur very curious about that because the study of ERP allows you to track at a high time resolution uh, the operation the brain is running to orient attention. So the first part of the, my talk was on some a recent development we had in this field. Um, we use a very conventional task, the Posner task, in which you, uh, you first see an arrow, for example, it tells you in this case, pay attention to the left. So this is called the Q period. And then after the Q period, there is a target, visual target that appears on the side indicated by the Q. In this case, the Q is valid. On the side opposite to that indicated by the Q, in this case, the, the, the target is called invalid. Or you can have a neutral situation in which no, no one of the two squares are Q. So you just have to attend the appearance of the target. Okay, um, I'm skipping about everything has to do with, with reaction time, but everything is really known about it. And I'm concentrating 
on, uh, on, on our findings in, in neglect patients, we are really curious to see what happens during the key period and during the target period. There were former studies, but they offered a, a rather fragmented information, especially with, 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 re with relationship to the target period and almost no information about the Q period when the patient actually promotes his attention to one set of space. So these were published in these two papers. And uh, uh, when you look at the electrophysiological responses of the brain that are activated by the Q, there are three phases. Uh, a very early phase we, we were when you have uh, this attentional negativity, which reflects the, the, the initial phase when you interpret the Q. A later phase where uh, frontal areas in particular are engaged. And this, is, this response is a model. This, it occurs independently of the modal sensory modality in, where, in which you are orienting attention. And where you have a higher negativity over the hemisphere that is uh, opposite to the, the, to the side of space to which you are directing your attention. And then you have a late response posterior, which reflects the preparatory effect, the facilitatory effects that are induced over the posterior occipital and parietal cortex by orienting of attention. And this is what happens in LT controls. And as you see, everything is normal here. Uh, in patients without neglect, we, you start having, these are patients without, with right brain damage, but who, have, do, who do not have neglect. You start to have some little alteration, but basically everything is maintained. What happens and is most interesting in patients with neglect is that, and this is a long uh, time issue in, in the domain of attention, is that they apparently have intact frontal uh, reaction or engagement of attention. But the point is that in, in, in face of this maintained ability of activating, engaging attention, there is no effect, no facilitatory effect over the posterior parietal uh, and occipital cortex. Um, so the, the, this is a basic failure. The, the, the lesion they have uh, uh, perturbates uh, the fact that engaging attention facilitates or prepares the um, posterior occipital and parietal cortex in processing the upcoming target. Uh, another way of looking at this is looking at the distribution of uh, alpha band activity over the two hemisphere. Uh, what usually happens that is the alpha activity gets more desynchronized over the hemisphere that is contralational, so, sorry, contralateral to the right direction of attention. This is what happens in normal controls. Um, uh, what happens in patients with neglect in particular uh, is that independently of the, of the direction of attention, the, the, there is a pathological increase of, of alpha activity, that the, of synchronized activity. There is no desynchronization over the damaged hemisphere, but a pathological synchronization of alpha activity. What is interesting is that the, this asymmetry, uh, this is true for, uh, for reaction time in normal subjects, but I'm concentrating in patients in, in, in right brain damaged patients, is that the higher is the imbalance of this uh, enhancement in alpha activity over the right hemisphere with respect to the left hemisphere, the stronger is the gland. That is, the stronger is the pathological deviation of attention toward the right, as measured for, for example, in the line bisection task. So this Q-related activity already um, tells you something more about uh, the pathology of our attention orienting in this patient. Uh, basically, the, if you look at the anatomical correlates, uh, in this patient suffers of lesions that are strategically placed in different points in, in the network of parietal and frontal areas that in the right hemisphere uh, drives uh, the orienting of attention in space. Okay, this was the Q period, but what happens when a target appears, when the, 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 the behavioral target appears in space? So it is interesting to know that one of the first uh, ERP electrophysiological responses uh, to the appearance of a lateral target is the P1. 
So let's, um, for example, think about a target that appears to work in, into the left side of space, a visual a target that appears in the left side of space. This target is going to evoke a, a, a P1 first in the right hemisphere, that is in the contralateral hemisphere, and then in the ipsilateral hemisphere after transfer with the corpus callosum. What is interesting is that uh, there are several evidence that shows that P1 has an, inhib an inhibitory role and that uh, the P1 over the hemisphere that is ipsilateral to the target, that is, that is the same hemisphere that is contralateral to the empty side of space, the P1 is higher. This shows you that the, 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 the ipsilateral hemisphere is actively inhibiting processing where nothing has been presented, okay? And we, we studied the same thing in patients in healthy controls and we got the same. You, you can see the contralateral P1 arrived first than the ipsilateral P1, which is higher, both for left targets in the left side of space and the right target of space. But what happens in the GLAD is, is that there is a pathological reversal when targets appear in the left side of space. That is the targets that appear uh, in the left side of space fail to activate uh, the inhibition of the empty right side of space. And this is a very early correlate of the pathological bias of attention that these patients suffer and uh, have toward, uh, they have a bias toward the right side of space. So this is an early phase of processing, but this is new because up to, to now, it was considered P1 was some way maintained normal in patients with neglect. And this is apparently not entirely true. We are more interested, however, in later components. The P3A is a component that originates in, in anterior areas and is uh, evoked by uh, events that are infrequent, rare, or unexpected. So the invalid targets in the poster targets are only 20% of targets, so they are rare and they appear at an unexpected position. And what happens is that patients with neglect have a pathologically enhanced P3R response for unexpected targets on the right side and a pathologically decreased uh, P3R response to targets in the left side. And this is another important correlate. It's like they had a, a pathologically higher novel interaction to stimulus on the right side and have no novel interaction for stimulus on the left side. The P3B is another important component. It is recorded over uh, uh, the originate mainly in parietal temporal cortex and parietal temporal junction. And in this case, what you found is that independently of the type of target, uh, patients with neglect have a lower P3B when targets appear in the left side of space. And this means that uh, since the P3 is the component that uh, makes a control of the correspondence between the direction of the queue and the position of a target, they fail to update the probabilistic link that is present between uh, the queue, in particular, that when the queue points toward the left and the target appears on the left. Um, so to summarize this, the result there is in patients with neglect, there are no facilitatory probability effect uh, uh, when in, in posterior areas, when anterior, anterior areas are still able of engaging attention, there is an enhanced novelty reaction for ipsilational target and reduced novelty reaction for contralational target. And there is a generalized reduced contextual updating for targets that appear in the left side of space. After this initial evidence, we recently moved to uh, another um, domain of study that is uh, predictive coding. Um, with this study, we wanted to test how and if patients with neglect are able to track the probabilistic distribution of events in the left side or right side of space. Uh, since the brain does not, this is pretty typical, the theory does not only passively be regular stimuli, but it actively computes and updates uh, probabilistic contingencies in the sensory environment. To do this, we use uh, an auditory task <clears throat> where you have four central tones, and then sometimes there is a left deviant tones or a right deviant tones, okay? 
and um, if you, these Debian tones produce two uh, main ERP responses. The first one is a mismatch negativity. Independently from the frequency of the shift in, in all the trials that you present, there is always a mismatch negativity, which is an early ERP responses that is generated in between the spare temporal gyros and inferofrontal gyros in this type of network, which is a pre-attentive signal that tells that something is different from the first four tones. But then what we, we, we did is that in different block of trials, we made the leftward Debian tones more frequent or the rightward Debian tones more frequent. So we manipulate uh, the percentage of deviation. So there was an acoustic environment with frequent Debian, Debian, left Debian tones and an acoustic environment with frequent right Debian tones. And uh, the, 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 the EEG response that tracks the fact that the tone is uh, more or less deviant in a block of trials uh, is a later uh, response, is the P3 response. So these are the basic results. If you are in, a, in an acoustic environment with frequent left deviant, so the majority of deviance is to the left and there are right deviant, rare, rare deviance, uh, you have a mismatch negativity in response to right deviance, but then you have no P300, even if the deviant tone is presented in the right side, in the good side of space. This means that in this case, when left deviant tones, they are signaled by, for example, by, by the mismatch negativity, are more frequent. Since the mismatch negativity is absent in patients with neglect when the tone is to the left, there is no prediction built, no higher order prediction built on the frequency of deviation of tones in the bulk in the, in the total number of trials. Vice versa, when acoustic environment is, is, is characterized by frequent right side deviant tones, uh, paradoxically, there is a P300 for left deviant so this shows you, to summarize, that neglect patients base their predictive behavior only on statistical irregularities that are related to the frequent occurrence of sensory events in the right side of space. This is because when the, uh, uh, the, the right deviant tones are predominant, there is a, 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 the release of a lot of match negativity signals that feeds up a higher level of prediction uh, that is that it is that that is marketed by, P, the, by the P300, and so the system, the nervous system, is able to pick up deviant tones at a more global, general level. Uh, we had a commentary uh, exactly on this uh, on this finding that is uh, basically I have summarized in my content what what this author uh, Marta Garrido and will say. That is the fact that. Uh, once you have an impaired mismatch negativity for left to our tones in patient neglect, uh, prediction can be built up only through uh, the frequent occurrence of mismatch negativities for the right side of space. In that case, the system produces a higher order prediction that uh, has to do with the frequency in a block of trial of the currents of left or right deviant tones. And so you have a correct P300 and a correct um, prediction at the more global level. So uh, to conclude this first part, I hope I have still time for the second. Um, in in terms of predictive coding, uh, neglect patients would be biased away from the contralation side of space because they expect low novelty reduction uh, and uncertainty in a resolution from fixating location in that side of space. Put in other words, or in short, the left side of space would offer poor changes in their beliefs on the probabilistic contingencies in that side of space, poor epistemic affordance. Vice versa, uh, since they show exaggerated no direction to right side of stimuli, they have an increase, a pathologically increased epistemic affordance for the right side of space. So I think these, uh, I hope these um, findings are opening up a new line of research. Uh, we are not the only one. There are people like Freestone who is trying to remodel interpreting neglect in predictive coding term, but it seems really promising. So any collaboration on this topic would be most welcome. 
and I hope this will be uh, possible through the, uh, the the alliance that is being created by among our universities. So in the uh, second part, I, I will be talking briefly, hope, hopefully, um, on another type of problem uh, on which we have been working uh, 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 quite a lot in, in, in my lab in the last 10, 12 years, that is the spatial representation of numbers. Uh, these are, um, there, may, there are several evidence showing that people have the tendency to mentally align uh, uh, using different types of uh, mental number lines, align uh, numbers in, in, men, in, in mental space. So, so give uh, some kind of imagery, special organization to numbers that uh, most frequently is aligned uh, and linked to reading habits. So it is most frequently from left to right. These are all introspective observation reported at the end of the 19th century by Francis Galton. The most uh, um, uh, important source of evidence, of behavioral evidence for this uh, uh, type of representation comes from the snark effect. Uh, for example, if you are in the front of a computer screen or you, are, you hear a number or you're shown with a central number and you're asked, please push, push the left button if the number is lower than five, push the right button if the no number is higher than five, you are much faster than when you get the reverse instruction, that is push the left button if the number is higher than five. So this has always been interpreted as saying that numbers are automatically imagined or are intrinsically imagined as being arranged from left to right. All these number, uh, not the Arabic numbers, but it, this effect is, has been mainly reported for Arabic numbers. And over the years, we have been um, maturing a very different idea about this phenomenon. So um, in these two works, uh, we uh, investigated if this is true using uh, exactly the paradigm of neglect. So one interesting thing is that sometimes neglect affects your representational space. So you are unable to imagine the left side of environments or objects or recovery from memory the left side of environments of object. And we, uh, one of the typical tasks that is used in neglect is the o'clock task, where you are asked to imagine numbers on a clock face. So this is very interesting because uh, if the so-called mental number line is really organized from left to right, with small numbers on the left and high numbers on the right, well, the clock phase has a different, totally different and opposite spatial organization because small numbers are on the right side and high, large numbers on the left side. So this allows you to make two contrasting hypotheses. If uh, patients with neglect, if numbers are organized spatially from left to right in a medium, in a special medium that is guide from left to right, then patients with neglect should omit small numbers when they are asked, for example, to bisect, not mentally bisect number intervals, saying what is the number in between one and nine or, or uh, one and seven or one and five. And uh, uh, the same bias toward the, the right side, but this time toward small numbers, when they're eventually asked to bisect clock time interval, time clock intervals. Vice versa, you can imagine that this, is, this deficit is not attentional, it's merely due to the fact that for some reason, um, the right brain damage uh, perturbates the ability to deal with small magnitudes. In this case, you have an opposite prediction that is the more you deviate toward higher numbers while bisecting mentally bisecting number intervals the more you deviate to high numbers also when you bisect uh, time time intervals on a mental clock phase and this is what happens this this work was made we collected independently uh, the same uh, the same findings uh, with Ivrio uh, uh, City in Lyon, and we once we met together and we, we observed that we had the same findings, so we decided to publish the findings together. So these results come from two independent observation, and what happens is the right word deviation on the mental number line said so the more you deviate toward higher numbers uh, while bisecting. 
a number intervals, the more you deviate toward higher numbers, that is to the left side of the clock phase, when you bisect time intervals. So this is this suggests that the, 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 this, this behavior is linked in some way to a deficit in dealing with small numerical magnitudes. Uh, I skip this because of time is not that relevant. So uh, when we look at, generally speaking, in, in several papers, we have been looking at the narrow correlates of this deficit, that is this deviation for higher numbers. Uh, univocally, we, all, all, we always found uh, the involvement, cortical subortical and involvement or, of the prefrontal components of the parietal frontal network of attention. So an area that is in good correspondence with this area that has been documented in the monkey in, in, in just in front of the arcuate sulcus with the prefrontal cortex. Um, there is another point that I want to make, and this is the end of my talk, is that, uh, okay, but you have the SNARK task. The SNARK task shows that you have faster reaction time with the left hand to small numbers and faster reaction time with the right hands to large numbers. Where do these effects come from? Okay. Oh, well, if you, a hint to this effect, to the region of this effect uh, was, uh, is provided by a very current set of findings showing that if you ask neglect patients to run the SNARK task, they are usually slower if, if you have to compare the magnitude of numbers with a central number five, they are usually an abnormal is lower at the setting that four is lower than five rather than six is higher than five. Like exactly like if they had difficulty in moving attention toward the left side of the mental number line. But we have another idea um, because this is co in contrast to, to the findings I showed you up before, but the, there is a basic difference between this task and the, uh, and the task of the mental bisection number interval. Because when you are asked to say which number is in the middle of one and nine, okay, you're not asked to use left, right spatial codes to provide an answer. Why in this task, you're asked, please push left, please push right. So the, the contrast between left and right is driven by the task itself. It, and, and so you can hypothesize that you are specializing number from left to right because you are asked to use left and right codes to select the response. And so we tested this in patients we neglect in a very simple way. Uh, this is quite recent. To the same patients we administer the SNARK task. So the task is push left if it's small, push right if it's higher than five. And in this case, we found again the asymmetry. So reaction times are much lower when um, you have to decide that four is smaller than five. But then if you change the task and you just change, you just ask, you, you, you do not provide left, right codes to provide a response. Just ask, push the bottom if it is lower and in other blocks, push the bottom if it is higher. In this case, there is no asymmetry within the very same patient. So this shows you that the, le the left, right or mental organization of, of the ascending series of integers is induced in this case by the fact that they, you are using you are asked to use left and right codes and uh, the brain in, the, in this condition, of course, reactivates automatically your reading habits. And so in this case, you mentally place the numbers from left to right. But if you are not asked to use left and right code to provide a response, there is no spatial representation of numbers. So this is very, the very last part of the talk. Uh, so what we have been done, uh, doing uh, lately is testing uh, uh, the same thing, basically the same thing in healthy participants. And the, the question we made is, do left and right spatial codes, if they are used in isolation, evoke the left-right representation of small and large number of magnitudes, or vice versa? If you are running a task where you are only using small large magnitude codes without using left right special codes does the fact that you're using this conceptual contrast most large small large does activate in your brain the corresponding special contrast left right 
to do these, these are the two papers. We use this, 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 this task was devised by reprised and applied to numbers by Martin Fisher and Semi Shaki. Um, um, you have a fixation point and then you have alternative targets. It can be arrow targets or numbers. And so in the first condition, you are asked to, the, to discriminate. In, in blocker trials, you are asked to discriminate, to push a single button, go response, when, the, for example, the arrow points left, and to push whenever a number appears. So if the link is automatic, if the coding, if, if you're coding left rather than right, uh, is the advantage you get for uh, responding to leftward uh, uh, arrows extending to small numbers or not? When you are not asking, ask at the same time to discriminate also the magnitude of numbers. And the answer is no. So if you are working with in these conditions where you are only using in, in, in each block of trial, you are only using or the special code or the magnitude code, there is no um, facilitation of direction of arrows left, let's, let's say left to magnitude of numbers and vice versa. There is no space number association. Vice versa, I move to the third experiment. I think I'll skip the second because of, of time. Um, if you are using at the same time rules that ask you to respond both to, to code, both the magnitude of the number and the direction of the arrow. So in this case, what go when the number is smaller than five and when an arrow points to the left. In this case, you are faster so there is a space to number association when the, the magnitude of the number and the direction of arrow are congruent in instruction. So left, since number, small numbers would be placed to the left side of a mental number line, is congruent with smaller than five, while, for example, right is incongruent with smaller than five. The same reasoning if you, you are using larger than five. And in this case, there is a very important congruency effect, which is also reliable. So in this case, if you are using at the same time, the two codes, the special codes and the number code, your brain is creating a mental number line. So you are faster if conceptually, you are in mind you have the concept, the congruent concept left and small, rather the incongruent concept left and larger than, uh, than five. So to conclude, uh, I'll skip the second condition. Uh, yes, what please have been wrap up. I, I have finished. Is yes, the last thank one. you. Last one. I'm sorry. Um, the, to to conclude, we are we are studying just studying the effect of this space number association with this type of task, and we have found that what determines the the birth of the original the space number association is a change in in the connectivity of uh, a network of arrow that is involved in, in number processing, like the precuneus, the interpretal sulcus, with uh, uh, the lateral occipital, lateral, um, uh, occipital temporal cortex uh, in the right hemisphere, which is probably involved in the categorical discrimination between the two types of stimuli. And that's all, just thank, uh, I'll skip the conclusion just to say that there is no, in inherent left spatial left right spatial organization of numbers this is generated by task instruction and uh, the, the spatially organized mental number lines are not all or non phenomena the mental number lines get progressively less noisy and more stable in mind side the more an observer fully combines left right spatial codes with small large magnitude codes to operate on numbers so thank you for your attention these are my collaborators and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, any question? Maybe we have time for a one question, I would say. Sorry about that. That was really too long. <laughs> okay, we have one. Okay, Laurent Goffard, let me give you the right to open your camera and, and your mic. You can go on, Laurent.
vero? Laurent? Oh, here he is. You should unmute yourself. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting talk. I have a question about the specificity of this uh, mountain line uh, with respect to numbers. Uh, do you observe a, a snark effect also when you test uh, objects with different size or different length? Is it really uh, something related to numbers, which are discrete elements? or uh, something which is related to magnitude, to size? Okay, the, the, the most direct answer is that if you, instead of Arabic numbers, use numerosities, let's say cloud of doubts, cloud of doubts of different num numerosity, it's hard to find the effect. I think this is the most direct answer to you. Your, your, your point is absolutely reasonable is that any, the, while the snark, uh, when you are using Arabic numbers is, I mean, is, is, is a sort of, is solid as a rock. You always find it. Nobody ever <laughs> filed to find the snark. If you are use a uh, cloud of dots that can be less or more numerous than five, you don't find the snark. Or some find, sometimes some, somebody finds the snark or they do not find the snark. So, the snark at least seems really linked to, to, to Arabic numbers and to the use of Arabic numbers and to, I would say, reading habits, of course. Hope this was clear as response. So if there are no other questions, I would have a quick one myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, going back to the results on a, uh, somewhat unexpected result about monitoring uh, probabilities on either side for neglect patients. Uh, um, it wasn't clear to me whether you, on top of the ERP results, you also had uh, matching behavioral data about the specific role of probability monitoring on the right side. Okay, the point is that when, when, you, when you do this kind of, of auditory task, you, you don't add, is a passive, so sort of passive task. Sometimes, sometimes somebody asks you, for example, to monitor the numbers of stimuli you give, but this was not the case. So it's really a passive task. So everything is, is really implicit in the sense, and it's good for us because it, it is a good test for what is the spontaneous computing of statistic, statistical probabilities in environment. So this is, was some kind of important side of the work and it, uh, that was re extremely informative to us. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have to move on to the uh, third and last speaker of this session. So Professor Li Zhaoping. Uh, from the University of Tübingen. In particular, she is the head of the Department for Sensory and uh, Sensory Motor Systems at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. And today she will tell us about looking and seeing by peripheral and central vision. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be involved in this um, a network, European-wide network, and uh, it's uh, uh, thank you for the great organization. Yeah, the talk is looking and seeing in peripheral and central vision. And uh, first of all, let me just start with a demo. So basically looking and seeing are two different processes. So even though they happen almost simultaneously, we do not feel the difference, but here's a demo. So imagine that I'm asking you to look for a uniquely oriented bar in this image. Well, that's very easy. You can find it within half a second. You can press button to report in half a second. Now imagine if I ask you to uh, superpose on each bar intersected by a vertical bar or horizontal bar on each bar, okay? And then what, what's the resulting image? It's that, where is that uniquely oriented bar? You may find it in key. Well, that's kind of difficult, yeah? Well, is that because it's, uh, uh, well, actually it's there. It's, of course, it's the same location. Now, why is it difficult? It's not just because it's randomly adding a lot of noise, okay, horizontal, vertical bar. Actually, because to find a uniquely ordered bar, it's just a, a sim simple image element. It really is only need primary visual cortex V1, okay? It, it, it's simple enough. However, your higher visual areas, for instance, uh, IT or V4 and stuff, they are starting to recognize the object and they see this item as a letter X. 
So therefore, they think, oh, there's another letter X, there's another letter X, well, they all look the same, yeah? And so it's like you look at a face, if the face is it rotated 90 degree or flipped you know, in a mirror image, you still think it's the same person. So therefore, you no longer think this is so unique. So I'm going to show you this looking and seeing in this visual search task. Now, right now, I'm gonna show you a whole image, really wide, almost as wide as, a, as, a, as the slide and see how many, just look for a uniquely oriented bar like that, okay? In, in this kind of image, a uniquely oriented bar, okay? Ready, steady, go. One second, two second, three second, okay. People usually take a few seconds and they still haven't found it, okay? Most people just haven't found it. Very straight, five seconds, 10 seconds. Well, the target is right there, okay? Target right there. And does that, you know, this is actually more than 600 items. Is that what's going on is, of course, people start their gaze in the center in a real experiment. And this is happening, this is one of the trials where you track the gaze. They actually, the first gaze already in the right direction. So and is this a rare event? No, they don't need training. Most of the subject within first second, 50% of the time they already land onto this target. And within two seconds, 90% of the child, they already land onto this target. So most of you have already, your gaze already went there. So this is looking, okay? This looking is mainly by bottom up saliency due to the unique oriented bar, okay? Now you can see that it's not very easy because if you gaze start here, in fact, you could not see it, okay? So therefore this looking by your gaze shift is done without seeing it because it's crowded, it's too crowded. So this looking is not because you recognize object. Now, once your gaze went onto it, this location is in your central visual field. Before you move there, it's in your peripheral visual. So it's your peripheral visual field that did the, this clever thing of make you go, it, go there, okay? And now it's in your central visual field. What happened? The gaze hesitated there, and then say, well, this is not exactly my target. And then it just left, kept going like that. And this happened perhaps to most of you. If you think you didn't find this target in half, in, in, in five seconds, that's probably what happened. Yeah. And so you can see that this is seeing. Seeing is when the target is in your central visual field, you get confused. Okay, so that's that's exactly what I mean by looking and seeing two different processes. So the the behind the theory and the, the, the idea, the concept goes like this. Visual input comes to your eyes and they go into V1, okay? And uh, of course, we all know that many centuries ago, we will find that in V1, you have these neurons uh, uh, excited by a particular orientation, small bars here, small bars there, tiny little orientation. And then you can imagine, okay, you can keep going on higher visual areas, perhaps neurons will be excited by more complicated things, including objects and phases and letter X and so on and so forth. And then, however, what happens uh, is that after many decades, uh, it seems like at least uh, uh, this ex expectation by Hubo Weasel is not quite met and what happened, yeah? And uh, uh, so my aim is, can we say, uh, ask a different question? Maybe if we ask the wrong question, then we cannot make progress as easily. So what is a different question? So recently I proposed that the vision can be seen as looking and seeing, okay? So looking and seeing are two different processes. But imagine the image comes in and first just uh, encoded by the retina and then looking really is to select a fraction of visual input to process further. This is the attentional bottleneck, okay? You cannot see everything clearly, so therefore you have to select just that bit, okay? That's it for instance. And so you have to shift your gaze to select that bit, and then you decode it and say, oh, that's a flower or something like that. And uh, all the massive information comes in is about you know 20 or 30 images per second, so therefore 20, 30 megabytes per second, that's about 20, 30 books per second. You can't read it. You can probably read less than one page. That attentional bottleneck has been actually measured more than half a century ago in 1950s. It's only 40 bits per second while it's coming in megabytes. So it's only less than 0.01% of information actually go to the bottleneck. It doesn't seem uh, very surprising until people realize we are more or less attentionally blind to things we don't pay attention to, yeah? And so the idea is the image, you know, going from the retina, then go to V1. However, at V1, you then create a saliency map from this image. A saliency map just, just says that, okay, this location is high saliency, this is the second high saliency, 
third highest in the city. This is a map of the visual world where saliency is most salient from, uh, uh, and this is a saliency value, which is then read out by the subcortical superior characters to shift your gaze to go to it, yeah? And uh, this is where selection starts at V1. So therefore, anything downstream uh, and, uh, and the seeing need to be uh, viewed uh, in light of this bottleneck starting from V1. So from V1, then you, uh, the information start to have to squeeze in, okay? You, you, you shift your gaze to the most salient location, which is that location. And then this becomes your central visual field. Uh, information goes in through the bottleneck. Okay, peripheral information also goes through, through the bottleneck. However, once this in the center, you say, oh, I can't see this very well because it's only impoverished information. Let's say, is this a red flower or is this a red apple? And then you say, okay, let me go back and fetch for more information. That's the feedback query. And now this fetching more information is feasible because in your mind, you have an internal model of the world of what the flower should look like and what an apple should look like. So this is kind of very purposeful with understanding. And so it's like a verify, is it a flower or apple? So therefore it can be done in a small bottleneck. Yeah. However, in the peripheral visual field, you, you just don't have the resources to do that. This is like my hypothesis that you don't have feedback. And that's why you have all these crowdings and all these kind of things. And you are also susceptible to visual illusions, okay? And so therefore, start thinking that attentional bottleneck start at V1, you really have to think differently. And this may be the reason why, if you don't change your way of thinking, it'll be more difficult to study the V2, V3, V4. And that may be the reason why people will also feel disappointed that not much effort has been made. Well, the idea is you have to think, uh, 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 raise a different question more or less. And uh, in particular, um, uh, I, uh, you know, this is kind of critical that uh, uh, bottleneck started being one. Well, is there any evidence for it? So this was a high process uh, uh, in 1990s. And then since then, we have more evidence uh, because this is critical for the new framework this starting with V1. The evidence, uh, my, my currently, uh, my current, uh, well, I'm going to tell you the evidence. But anyway, with that, we can then start a new framework. This is more like my current focus. Uh, looking, starting at V1 and uh, uh, seeing later on, oh, yeah. And uh, um, so therefore you have a central peripheral dichotomy in a sense that central visual field, you have better seeing capacities while peripheral vision is more for looking. And uh, um, so the evidence uh, to put this critical central center stage of selection at V1 comes, for example, one is in the visual behavior where we found uh, as a prediction of V1, saliency hypothesis and wish is that your gaze can be captured by a non-distinctive object. For example, if you put this image to your left eye and this image to your right eye, and what you perceive is the superposition of these two images, it's right here. And uh, this uh, letter X is distinctive from the right eye, but does not look any distinctive compared to other letter axes, because beyond prime visual cortex or visual cortex V2, V3, V4, they have only binocular neurons, so they cannot tell that this X is uniquely left eye or right eye. However, primary visual cortex can tell this is to the right eye and therefore make this more salient and then automatically attract your gaze to it. Your first gaze shift will most likely go there, even though you may be in a task to look for a uniquely a uh, unique letter O, oh, okay? So this is a little bit of a gaze distraction, which is actually attentional attraction in the bottom-up manner, the same is, okay? So therefore, this is a very strange, uh, a surprising prediction, but confirmed. And another piece of evidence coming uh, comes from uh, a monkey physiology in which you can make a monkey do a task let's say they start fixation here, and then once fixated, you flash on these bars. The task is to look for a uniquely oriented bar. It happened to be here. Yeah, it could be there and anywhere. And, uh, and then in the same time, let's say in some of the trials, this target happened to be in the rest of the field of a neuron you're recording. And of course, uh, uh, this trial can be interleaved with many other trials. Let's say there's multiple trials with exactly this input. And since the gaze starting here to, to shift there for the monkey's task is look for the spa and immediately move their gaze to it, it usually takes at least 200 milliseconds before the monkey moves. So, so therefore, you can measure with this 20 millisecond while the gaze is still there, what is the neural activities. So in some trials, this activity is higher, other trials lower, just because there's natural fluctuations in the neural responses. And then if the saliency hypothesis in V1 is correct, then the higher response should make the monkey move the eye faster than the lower response. And that's indeed what's seen. This is the V1 response of this neuron 
versus the time of the stimulus presentation since time zero then all the stimulus coming out you can see the initial response in v1 if it's initially very high those are the trials with fastest faster saccade to the target and so this is a very strong uh, uh, linking of the physiology with CDC behavior. So with this, then you can say, okay, now with the rest of the visual system, uh, V2, V3, V4, and also the after the looking, you start to have the seeing have to be considered a start and bottleneck starts, yeah? And, uh, and uh, in particular, in the peripheral vision, because now once your gaze uh, look over there and put this in your central visual field, which does have feedback, your peripheral vision does not have feedback. So therefore, if it says, oh, what is that? Okay, in the peripheral vision, say, oh, maybe this is a little cheese on the moon or something like that. And therefore you cannot really go back wherever it's a really cheese on the moon, let me have a look. And there is no feedback. So therefore you'll be uh, susceptible. Uh, you, know, you, you, you are better at looking in peripheral vision, so therefore you'll be worse at seeing, so because you cannot go verify. And therefore, you'll be susceptible to, to illusions. And now, illusions are visual treasures in our visual community. And then you can say, well, is there really true illusions happen more likely in peripheral vision? Yes, indeed, that's the case. Look at this. You know, do you see this flashing of these dots in peripheral vision? Yeah. But if you stare on it, just somehow the flash is not there. When you stare at it, it's in your central visual field. And so it only flashes in your peripheral vision. And here is a static image, but somehow in your peripheral. it doesn't appear static but see oh you know uh, having this peripheral uh, illusion yeah and, and uh, here is another very striking illusion and you see this is a you know clockwise rotating uh, wheel yeah well if you look at it directly this thing is not moving well sometimes it's moving clockwise sometimes be anti-clockwise or so clockwise kind of from one frame to another one frame is clockwise when the opposite anti-clockwise and so on but however if you stay over here and here and then this become a peripheral visual field then it really looks a striking illusion now what's going on when it's moving clockwise it's actually from black to black or white to black so it's the same uh, con contrast polarity moving forward but when it moves backward it's actually flip contrast okay go from white to black or black to white and and this actually activates a v1 neuron uh, in a way as if it's moving uh, clockwise this is why it can have this illusion yeah this is called reverse fire motion illusion and now you understand that with the v1 signal if it's you know uh, v1 signal exi existing going further it will give you this illusion if there's a bottleneck you can then predict your own illusion this is what we do okay so in this case this is actually analogous case here you have a lot of these dot pairs they are all vertical you know we call this whole pairs because in each pair the two dots have the same color white or black and there's no illusion you need to see there are vertical no illusion here these are header pairs okay each pair is a black and white and like when this is a little bit like this motion going backwards it's changing uh, contrast polarity. And so therefore, uh, even though it looks uh, vertical it, when you look stared at in your central visual field, if you look at this imaging peripheral vision, imagine you fix it here and trying to see what is this orientation? Okay, are these orientation vertical or horizontal? People say, gee, I can't tell if I fix, fix it. But it's a false choice. They would say this horizontal, okay? And then you say, gee, I'm not convinced. It's not quite clear. So let me give you a demo. It's more convincing. So the demo is like this. Imagine you fix it here. Yeah, fix it on this cross. Do you see this big ring? Yes, this is a big ring. It's not an illusion. This is made by many homo pairs. Okay, they are each homo pair is tangential to this ring. And so therefore you see there's no illusion here. Now I give you another image where it's exactly the same, except every second pair is a header pair. Okay, so every it's a header pair, home pair, homo pair, header pair, homo pair. And this every second is a head of pair. So if you fix it here, this becomes a peripheral visual field. As I explained to you, it should be looking in a peripheral as if it's perpendicular, okay? And so therefore, every second pair is perpendicular. That's why if you stare at the center, somehow you can't see this ring anymore because it's parallel, perpendicular, parallel, perpendicular when you look at that. It's the illusion, okay? And they say, okay, wait a minute. What if I make this head of pair actually perpendicular to the ring and then by the illusion it should appear parallel therefore i can see the ring better is that right okay let's see whether this happens indeed in the third case we just make this header pair perpendicular okay now it's perpendicular so if you fix it here it should appear parallel and therefore you should see the ring better can you do that fix it here 
Do you see the ring better here? Then fixate here and see the ring better there. Yeah, and that's indeed and it's the perpendicular. Okay, parallel. And let's try. And people indeed see that this ring is more easily seen. However, if your central vision going there, no, it's not true. Central vision going there, the ring is. So central peripheral indeed are very different, uh, uh, extremely different from each other. Okay, you can even uh, uh, do an analogous case in steroid. Or let me explain to you how this goes. Okay, in uh, primary visual cortex, we all understand. Imagine we have a, a simple neuron in the simple cell in primary visual cortex. It has a the field this way. It's, horizontally oriented. So this neuron prefer a horizontally oriented object. But if you put a halo bed in it, but the black dot, the vertical oriented halo pair, it will excite this neuron horizontal, yeah? And uh, however, this neuron can also be excited by a horizontally oriented uh, homo pair, a black a white pair or black hair, or even a gavor. However, if you put this uh, vertical Heteropay into a vertical oriented neuron, and this neuron cannot be so easily excited, okay, because they cancel each other, black and white cancel each other. Here it excites it, okay. And uh, so, therefore, if you have this horizontal homo pair on the retina, it will excite a V1 neuron preferring horizontal. Uh, imagine the bottleneck starts in V1, okay. A, a, a V1 send uh, only this neuron in V1 is sending output to V2, V3, V4, and so on. And then no other neurons sending forward. So this is an extreme bottleneck. And this is just for a theoretical concept. No other neurons sending information downstream. And so therefore, V2, V3, V4, let's say this neuron's name is Mary. And say, oh, Mary is uh, firing a lot. And I know they have the knowledge of the uh, visual um, the worlds. And when the, whenever the Mary fires a lot, it could be this input, that input, that input, that who knows which one. And the majority vote will say, okay, it's horizontal. That's why this vertical pedal pair will appear horizontal. If you have to guess from this limited impoverished information, only Mary neuron is sending information forward. However, if we can afford to say, oh, what if I go back and, and verify, okay, go back to verify, it could, could be that, you know, maybe it's this input. So if you can go back and verify, you say, oh, uh, by the way, it's actually vertical. So central visual field have this feedback loop to do verification, and this signifies understanding that it could be, you know, Mary neuron can be activated by that, and so this is the, the idea. But if you cannot verify, you will see this is uh, horizontal. So this is the idea. And uh, now we understand how this illusion comes about. You can even extend generalize to stereo vision. In this case, you can have the left eye input seeing this image, right eye input seeing, let's say these two images uh, are matched. So that the black bar matches a black dot, a black dot versus black dot in two eyes and, and a white dot uh, matches another white dot in the two eyes. So this is the analogous homo pairs, yeah? And so therefore, if the, there is a relative shift like this way, this is a particular shift, it's called a horizontal disparity. This will make this disc appear in front. This is the stereo vision. This is the more normal uh, random loss stereo where it works like this. You can also have the shift in the other direction, the, another di relative shift, then it will make the disc go backwards, okay? This is when things are all homo pairs. However, you can also have hetero pairs in the sense that a black dot in one eye matches a black, a white matches black and vice versa. And in such a case, these are hetero pairs and with the exact analogy, just like in the orientation case, now V1 neuron will respond as if that is reverse, just like in orientation, horizontal become vertical and vice versa. So therefore, even though let's say this has exactly the same disparity as in the top, uh, uh, the V1 neuron fires as if uh, this disk is behind, not in front, yeah? And so these are called contrast reverse or anti correlated random dot stereograms for this central disk. And uh, what happens is if you look in full view of vision, you just look in a central visual field, you cannot see whether it's in front or behind, even though V1 neuron is telling you that this disk is behind. Now, why is that? Because V1 neuron feed forward this reverse that says behind, behind, behind to V2, V3, V4, and so on, and then top-down feedback, the higher visual area say, gee, I'm not sure if this looks very noisy. Let me just go back to see, is it really behind? And when it comes back to see, and say, well, not only it's not quite behind, black become white and vice versa. So therefore, vetoes the fake news, because V1, you are telling me fake news, therefore, 
Vito is this fake news, therefore you do not see this behind, there's no depth. That's why in central vision, you can't see whether it's in front or behind because it's all Vito. Now, however, and so therefore the central vision is, is having this knowledge. You can be, you don't get fooled by these uh, illusions of fake news. However, if you don't have these feedback in peripheral vision, then you would have to believe whatever uh, the fake news V1 tells you. So therefore in peripheral vision, you should see this is indeed behind. So this is actually a prediction coming from this framework and this prediction is that observed indeed in a, a, a visual behavior. You can even try yourself in the front. In this case, it's the normal disparity. If you can free fuse this, you should see that uh, the central disk is in front. Okay, can you see it actually? I'm getting myself a bit too wide. Yeah, but anyway, once you can see, but here is a, a anti correlated head of pay. You cannot see if you free fuse, it doesn't look in front or behind. However, once you free fuse this bottom pair, now try to keep fusing and slowly move your gaze to the top, such that your attention is still observing this bottom fair pair, but your gaze in the top. Then this disc is in your peripheral visual field, lower visual field. Then you can perhaps see that this disc is behind, okay? Depending on how you feel, in a sense that the depth of this disc is opposite to the depth of that disc, even though they have the same disparity. This is exactly the illusion we predicted and it's observed, yeah? And so therefore, peripheral vision, you can really enjoy all these illusions in this, in this framework. And what about central vision? Well, central vision, you have both feed forward and feedback, both bottom up and top down. And therefore you have uh, seeing is understanding because top down is trying to say, oh, is this flower or apple? You, you know, is this like a hello pair, homo pair, you know, a Mary neuron fires, there could be different kinds of things to excite this neuron and so forth. This is like having an internal model of how neurons behave. And this is as if you are knowing the code book of vision. So therefore you can always veto the fake news, misleading fake news, and you understand that you can overcome occlusion, you can overcome uh, uh, illusions and so on, yeah? And so that's the reason why here you cannot you cannot see this fake news from V1, okay? Because it's vetoed, yeah? And therefore we can uh, take advantage of this because I have a limited time. I could not uh, speak to uh, details. However, it is, uh, this is called analysis by central, uh, synthesis. Uh, imagine how one neuron should behave, whether it's flower or uh, you know, how V1 neuron should react if it's flower versus an apple and so on, or if it's you know, vertical versus horizontal and so on, yeah? And uh, we can study it more. We can even uh, look at what is it because fee forward feedback, fee forward feedback can be iterative in loops, and you can study it in uh, stereo vision. And uh, you can also study things like uh, how does it work in visual masking when you have ambiguous perception or brief displays and so on. And uh, because looking mostly happens in peripheral vision and seeing most happening in, in central vision, in your natural behavior, you are, you are moving your eyes from here to there, you are fixating and moving. And so therefore in the real time visual behavior, it's actually looking and seeing in a dynamic dance, uh, saccadic fixations and so on. And this can really be studied. And uh, this is an uh, ongoing project in, in my lab uh, we are trying to uh, uh, answer these questions in higher vision, visual areas, both uh, in terms of uh, neural circuits as well as, as, uh, as behavior. And hopefully we can overcome this uh, persistent frontier that Hugo Weasel mentioned that how come we are not making as much quick progress as expected by their seminal work. Uh, and we're recognizing this is because of something happened in V1 and this may be triggering lots of other things going on. And uh, 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 for this, we actually, uh, you know, uh, I like to thank uh, the fundings and many of my collaborators uh, in, in, in many years of our work. And uh, uh, please join us, whether you come to visit us or collaborate or uh, join us uh, for uh, PhD training or and so on. And we, I, I look forward to hearing your feedback and interacting with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions from the audience? I see there is one in the Q&A. Okay. So uh, uh, how do I look at the Q&A? Would well, I, can, I can read it aloud for you if you want. Yeah, so yes, could, could these mechanisms have an evolutionary meaning? 
uh, yes. Uh, so, for instance, when uh, when you have this distracted thing of uh, 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 you know you should look around. In fact, evolutionary V1 uh, was not there in lower vertebrates because we don't have the neocortex. So it's actually in the optic tectum. So, for instance, in fish, or, or we don't even know whether rodent, you know, rodent does have a V1 and uh, and uh, uh, optic tectum, which is a superior colliculus. And so, therefore, um, you could uh, you could say in fish, it's definitely happening in, in optic tectum. Uh, in primates, it seems to be in V1, as I already sh show in these evidences from the monkey work. Yeah, we, we find that in monkey, it seems to be uh, in V1. And then you can say in rodent, is it a job share between uh, supercritus and V1? You know, for instance, if you region V1 in rodent, uh, they don't seem to be as impaired as if you lesion V1 in, uh, in uh, 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 monkeys, yeah? And so imagine if you have a, a stroke to have your V1 in, uh, damaged, you will be less distractible, but also you'll be almost uh, unable to, to be alerted by sudden uh, exogenous things that should attract your attention, such as when you're reading a book, suddenly a tiger jumping at you from the periphery, then you will not be alerted. You, you will just lose your um, evolutionary protection. Yeah. And so that, that should be the, the, the things. And you can also answer the, ask the question about how about developmental stages, you know, when you uh, teenagers, let's say children, their frontal haven't quite been developed, but maybe their posterior V1 is very active. Now, could that be the reason why they are so distractible? No, and, I, and this is a complete speculation, but it's worth thinking about what is ADHD? Is that because their V1 and frontal is, is V1 is winning and frontal is losing? Uh, well, how, how do people grow out of ADHD? Is that because their frontal get more mature? This is all speculative in the developmental thread, but you can also think about it as a, as a, as a uh, evolutionary, uh, we humans are very good at the frontal controls, while the lower vertebrates, they are just so ballistically uh, predictable because it's all about them. There's another question from one of the panelists, Thierry. And could you also read that question? Uh, no, me? no, it, is it someone who could speak aloud. Thierry, do you want to say it aloud? I cannot see the Q and A somehow, and so if no, no, no. So th this person has not written. It was he raised his hand. No, sorry, it was a mistake. I didn't okay. see my hand raised. <laughs> hello, hello, yeah. Hello. Okay, fair enough. Then I do have a question. Um, so related to this central to peripheral uh, prediction. So, so you predict that we basically move our gaze to verify some uh, some hypothesis some some feedback information uh, what would you predict in a, in a similar conditions but when the object moves itself from the periphery to the central uh, part of our visual field would you predict some mismatching behavioral effect uh, uh, i would imagine so this is when you move your gaze to it suddenly let's say it also start to move away. Well, I guess you will have mismatch. This is, uh, people could do this experiment while the gaze is in mid fright you can shift the target and often they will then have a corrective saccad. If you do that quick enough, somehow after a while they will adapt. Uh, uh, if you do that often enough, they will adapt their gaze trajectory. So this is in addition, you I imagine maybe the superior click is uh, somehow the motor, motor program start to, uh, basically, it's a mapping from a saliency map to a motor command, and this particular mapping could be adaptable, uh, I suspect, but uh, uh, your V1 perhaps is still is faithfully trying to represent the visual field, there's a salient location there, and that's my but Okay, uh, thank you. That, that was uh, part, of, part of my question. But the other part was, what if the eyes don't move at all? So, so no saccades to, to yeah. the cell. Oh, this is interesting. So the idea is, when I demonstrate this to you, it turns out that the first trial, this is really strong, okay? And later trials, the subjects start to know. They realize they always, whenever they look, they disappear. Then they say, well, the best thing is when you do this touch, just fix it, don't even... Uh, uh, move your eyes, okay? Because the task 
was that press the left button if this target is in the left half of the visual field, press right button. So I didn't ask the subject whether it's left to the right, to the, it just said left or right. So it's a where task rather than what kind of task. So they realized that they fix it here, don't move that gaze. And if you feel as if something salient, then they press left button. So they can do better task wise this way if they don't move their eyes. That means they don't have this uh, uh, kind of a top down uh, uh, object recognition to interfere with them because they did not engage the central visual field. And I actually uh, follow up this uh, study with collaborators, uh, Lisa Cipollati and Ms. Emiliano uh, Oliveri. Um, what we did was we used TMS to hit uh, uh, the right parietal cortex. <laughs> Where you hit the right parietal cortex, then they don't get so confused. You can say, what is right parietal cortex? It's a little bit higher level attentional network. And it, it may also be where, uh, you can combine a, a horizontal bar and a, a tilted bar together to form an object, you know, feature binding uh, X, yeah? And if you do that, the subject don't get so confused. It's like you damage the brain network a little bit so that you uh, disable the scene, but then this task is done better because this task is actually a looking task. The subject say is asked to do press a button where it is rather than what it is. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's how, things could work, you, 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 can, you can decipher what's going on through these standards. And we can even uh, do a masking. So what happened was we do the con gaze continues in masking. When the subject gaze landed there, once they landed there, you immediately mask the whole thing. Okay, and then you ask such a, what happened? Yeah, uh, uh, where is the target? They, they didn't see it. I said, well, just give a false choice guess whether it's in the left or right. And they, uh, more than 90% of the time, they guess correctly. Of course, I have control trials when they, their eyes go somewhere else and, and mask. So they didn't know that in some trials there, I happen to be landed there, they mask. Yeah, and so I, I confused them. But when the, in some of the trials, they happen, happen to be there and they mask, they say they, say they didn't see it, but then more than 90% of the time, they actually answer correctly. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. Any other question? Maybe there's time for one more, a quick one. Uh, no, I don't see any other raised hands. So I thank all the three speakers of this last session again. And I think we can now move to the very last session of, of today's symposium.